From Cahazavine district, representing the parishes of Balanskerig, Cahazavine, Cahardanil, Valencia, and Waterville, the area rep there is Pat Kavna, the storyteller, an underwater filmer, an artist, a musician, a writer, a technologist, and a PhD candidate with Smart Lab UCD, the founder of Wild Dairy Nan, Vincent Highland, with two short stories, both encounters with Dairy Nan wildlife. The Empress, the story of Vinny's encounter and personal journey with the magnificent Emperor Moth. And the second story, Nine Brains versus One Brain, Vinny's underwater nightmare encounter with the Atlantic octopus beneath Carrie Grahan Dairy Nan. In my hand, I hold life. Not any ordinary life, this is the life of something, an animal that was created through the meeting of an empress and an emperor. These are female and male moths and they fly in Derry Nan every summer. But very few people have seen them. I, for my part, have gone and climbed up the hills and over valleys and I've seen these very, very fast large moths flying during the day. I later found out that they were male emperor moths in search for a female. The female, on the other hand, flies at night. This story evolves around the fact that one night, back in April, three years ago, 2015, we heard a knocking on our window. And what was amazing about that was that we wouldn't expect somebody to knock so late in the evening on our window, let alone our door. So I went out a little bit scared, and when I turned the corner and looked to the right-hand side, our light, our outside light, shone on this amazing large moth. I'd never seen it before. Quickly, I went inside, I got my net, I got a jar, and I went out to see if I could capture this beautiful animal, this beautiful creature that I'd never seen before. When I caught it in its net, I put it into a jar, and I took it inside and I looked through the jar and I just saw this amazing pattern emerge on the wings of this beautiful moth. At this stage I didn't know what it was, I didn't know if it was a male or female. On further investigation I found out that it was a female emperor moth. I took some photographs and I went back outside into the dark, starry night and I let her go. Not thinking about anything, I left the jar on my desk and I went to sleep. The next morning I woke up and there in the bottom of the jar were 20 eggs. I said, oh my God, I've done this before. I've taken eggs. I've reared butterfly eggs into caterpillars and into emerging butterflies again. But I'd never done this for a moth. And I was intrigued. I said, maybe, just upon maybe, these eggs are fertilized. And lo and behold, 10 days later, out pops these tiny little black caterpillars. I was mesmerized. I ran, quickly ran up to my young uh, eight-year-old son at the time and uh, my partner Mo, and I showed them, I said, look, look what's after happening. And they looked in and they too saw these tiny little one millimeter long furry animals. We didn't really know what they looked like. I went back to the computer. I had a look at the developing stages of emperor moth caterpillars. And to my amazement, they would grow from one millimeter all the way up to about seven and a half millimeters in size over the period of about two months. But I didn't know what to feed them. So I had to research that too. And I found out that they actually eat bramble leaves. So <clears throat> fastidiously, I went out every morning and I cut out uh, a whole load of bramble leaves and I put them into this area, this area that I'd actually created for these emerging caterpillars. As the days went by, the caterpillars started to grow and then I found out subsequently that they shed their skin every now and then, in fact five times in this case over the period of the two months up until June. And as they grew and grew they changed colour, they um, changed into this beautiful emerald green and black hairy form that were just voracious feeders but then they'd sleep and they'd also poo so I actually had to clean out their poo from the uh, enclosure every day. So every morning ri ritualistically we'd sit at breakfast my son would be eating his porridge, my partner Mo would be there looking at me, are you crazy? <laughs> and I just did it. And um, then one day I came in, and I happened to be uh, two in the afternoon actually, and it was a beautiful sunny, sunny day, and there they were, the moths were starting to make their cocoon, and that's exactly what I'm holding here, this is life. This is one of the cocoons that were created in June 2015 that I hold in my hand. The significance is this, is that, um, I am 
I was wholly responsible for the development of these um, creatures in the context of that they had a safe place to grow. We waited and waited and waited and when I researched a little bit more I found out that they would probably emerge from their cocoons. There was 20 cocoons eventually in the end. They would, they would emerge the following April. And in April 2016, right on cue, eight of these emperor moths, new emperor moth offspring, male and females, emerged in the little enclosure that I'd created. And to our joy, we went every morning that they emerged and we put them on our hands, I put them on my kid's hand, I put them on Mo's hand and we opened the door and we let them go into the environment. And the reason that I tell this story is because it's a fantastic example of how to connect people with their surroundings, with the animals that we share our surroundings with. And that, to you and to me, of course, is the story of the Emperor Moth. So my fascination with wildlife started a very long time ago. I was always interested in water. And in particular, when we got a black and white television in the mid-60s into the house, I saw Jacques Cousteau for the very first time. I was hooked. I wanted to be a diver. I wanted to explore underwater. And thankfully, I've been able to pursue that over many, many years. In fact, I started diving in my teens. And I was lucky enough to come down to Caradaniel, to Derry Nan, that part of Kerry that I now live in for the last 10 years. And I've had these amazing encounters. And as I get older, uh, I'm really interested in um, nighttime animal behaviour underwater. I love this idea of just being at one with the watery environment, particularly in darkness, and just having one light and shining that light in on everything that goes on below the water that I look out on every day. And this is what I did in the context of the octopus here. This octopus I filmed one very chilly November uh, night. I got on my gear. I had psyched myself up to go on a night dive. I wanted to see what was below the water um, in winter, the start of the winter. Because not many people get to experience that uh, unless you're a diver. And there's very few people in Ireland really that dive. So it was important for me to bring all my camera gear, to put on all my gear, so that I could get in the water and experience that. Now normally what I do in this particular dive site, it's just off Derrynan Beach. And it's at the back of a small little island ca called Carrigy Crown. I swim out on the surface. And I have all my gear, I have my camera, and in November the water is extremely chilly, so you get a little bit of a shock, but that's kind of you know, negated uh, against by just when you turn on your back then and you just look up at the starry sky, the blazing constellations above in a beautiful starry sky. And there I was, I snorkeled out on my back, out to this particular point, and then when I reached the point where I knew I wanted to descend underwater, I stopped and I let the air out of my jacket, and I descended in darkness. And as I descended, I went down 10 feet, 15 feet, 20 feet, 25 feet, until I reached the bottom, and it was a sandy bottom, but I knew exactly where I was going to kneel. I knelt on the sand, and then I turned on my lights, and to my amazement, just in front of me was this guy, this octopus. It got startled. I got startled. I turned off my light. What do I do next? Do I wait just to... Do I have a chance for the very first time in my life to film up close an Atlantic octopus? I'd seen many before, but every time you went close to them, they darted off. This was my chance. I turned on the lights again. It was still there. It looked at me. We both stared at each other. Now, I've got one brain. It's got nine brains. So what was it thinking? Who was this noisy, bubble-maker, lighted-up person or thing? And I knew exactly what it was. But it was like as if it was one brain versus nine brains. So we were psyching each other out, looking at each other. I turned my lights off again. I said, OK, the next move I'm going to make when I turn on my lights is I'm going to try and fill them, go and try to get real close to the octopus. And in my amazement in the darkness, the thing came over and sat on my head. I could just feel it sitting on my head. This thing was two and a half foot long. And the tentacles went down over my mask, and some went down my back. And I started to get really freaky. But my breathing, I really had to concentrate on controlling my breathing because as you exhale air, you can exhale air really f rapidly, uh, but if you calm yourself down, you can just let the bubbles go out really, really tiny, really small. And that's what I did. And eventually the thing just lifted off my head. And when I turned on my lights, there it allowed me to follow it for the next 11 minutes. And I got the most incredible footage of me and this octopus just 
being at one together and it allowing me, that's the most important thing, allowing me to follow it through, kelp, to see it in its natural environment, looking for something to eat in the cold, chilly November water beneath the sea 